Okay, welcome back to the Classics of Immunology Journal Club. Um, and today we're dealing with a paper from 2001. We finally got into more modern times. And but before we get started, uh, don't forget to like the video on the YouTube channel and click on the bell, to get notified, subscribe, check out the website and look at, at the writing tab on my website, kendallasmith.com. And on the writing tab, you'll find all the classic papers um, that I've discussed, that I'm discussing in, in this journal club. Today, we're dealing with a paper. The authors, as the, senior, the first author is uh, Lena Alexopoulou, and the senior author is Richard Flavel, and this is, comes from Yale. It was published in Nature in October of 2001, and the title is Recognition of Double-Stranded RNA and Activation of NF-kappa-B-like toll-like receptor number three. And I thought we'd just carry on a little bit after we did the um, landmark paper by Bruce Boitler from 1998. So this is just three years later, 2001. Because I, I'd like to highlight what happened in this field. There was just an explosion of work that was looking at the, the subsequent um, definition of the toll-like receptors. Meant, uh, you might remember that I mentioned that there were 10 or 12 different genes coding for toll-like receptors in the mammalian situation. And um, so the, the race was on, really, to find out what all these things were. And I wanted to, um, I, I wanted to, to really uh, emphasize the fact that this, is, this, this um, recognition system with the toll-like receptors and uh, triggering them with, with um, patterns uh, from microbes was an ancient, ancient, ancient uh, immunological system, that, which really is what we call today the innate immune response. And, and of course, and, and so, that, so that understanding this was really a breakthrough on, on Bruce Boitler's part, as I said last week. The other, th the other reason, there's a couple of other reasons that I wanted to, to go into this is, is that the, what we're going to focus on today is, is one of the, of the uh, toll-like receptors that recognizes viruses. And of course, we're sort of steeped in virology here now th these days, as opposed to bacteriology or parasitology or some of these other kinds of bugs that invade our bodies. Viruses being so small and so simple uh, are, are difficult uh, for, from the standpoint of the host to deal with. And one of the major, major mechanisms that, uh, that was evolved, evolved, selected for, and so forth, was um, the production of interferon, the molecule that was first described in 1957 by Isaacs and Lindemann. And then it wasn't until this early 70s that um, the that it started to get a lot of play. And it started to get a lot of play because people found that interferon would inhibit the, the proliferation uh, of um, cancer cells in culture. Uh, and that was in the late 60s or, or early 70s. And that's when I started in the biz. I was a postdoc at Dartmouth Medical School in 1972-3. And my, my mentor, Ross McIntyre, was interested in trying to, to use synthetic uh, double-stranded RNA molecules in the clinic to induce interferon. And so there were several around. And I had already worked on one of them at the NCI in the year prior to that, PolyAU. And uh, at Dartmouth, they were interested in PolyIC. And what that was was a long strand of innocent and then a long strand of uh, cytidines, uh, and then they would make a double helix. And so the double-stranded RNA was the key in, in this whole thing. Uh, and so that was back in 1972. So, and this paper came out in 2001. Uh, and so, you know, that was 30 years later. And a lot happened in that 30 years and really was the, the dawning. 1970 was really the dawning of the age of molecular immunity, uh, of course, which I've written my, my book about that just came out um, a year or so ago. Well, now it's 20 years beyond that. So that was 50 years ago in 1971, too. The only reason to mention that, in addition to the fact that that's part of my, my history, 
um, is, is that, you know, it's, it's important, I think, if you're going to be a scientist and really understand the field you're working in, you have to know the history and where everything came from and what the, what the uh, initial uh, observations were and the initial publications and then whether, things, whether the story changed over time and so forth. So today's paper is a follow-up of Bruce Boitler's 98 paper uh, about toll-like receptors. And in the introduction the uh, the authors go into the uh, into the whole scene and when they make the point first off straight off that the toll like receptors are a family of the innate meaning invertebrate and then a therefore ancient immune recognition receptors that recognize molecular patterns associated with microbial pathogens and induce antimicrobial responses so then they focus in on double stranded rna and they say that it's a molecular pattern associated with viral infections because most viruses produce double-stranded RNAs at some point during their replicative cycle. And double-stranded RNA is not found in, in mammalian cells, in vertebrate cells. And so it was a pattern um, that the hosts evolved in, uh, in order to recognize the fact that they had these foreign, foreigners on board. And double-stranded RNA, when it was used back in the 70s when I started, you know, we'd add it to our cultures, but we had no idea what happened to it or what, what was going on, whether there was a receptor on the cell surface, whether or not it got into the cells, whether there was... And now we know that the, that the double-stranded RNA um, is an intracellular, binds to intracellular toll-like receptor receptors that are in the cytoplasm. And the question that these investigators were interested in was whether or not there was one of the, one of the uh, gene products that was recognizing double-stranded RNA, and they were using poly-IC as their prototypic double-stranded RNA. In order to, to study this whole thing, what they did was they, uh, they expressed a range of, by this time there was a lot of TLRs that have been cloned and sequenced and so forth. So they expressed a, a range of uh, TLRs in 293 T cells. Uh, and uh, they did numbers one through six and, and also nine. Uh, and they would transfect in the, these genes. And then at the same time, they would trans, transfect in reporter genes for uh, NF kappa B. And it was a luciferase uh, kind of thing so that they got, got a got a light signal out of this whole thing. So let's do some screen sharing here in terms of the, the data. Now, I'm not going to go through all uh, data in this paper, only a, a, a little bit of it, to, just to make the point. So, okay, so this is figure one. Uh, and what they're, what they're trying to show in this figure is that TLR3 specificity signals for NF-kappa B activation in response to poly-IC. And so what they've done is that they've used their transfectants. This is their vector control, transfected with TLR3 or transfected with TLR2. And you can see the open bars are medium control. The solid ones are poly-IC, so that now when you have TLR3 there present, you see a, a very positive signal. And uh, if TLR2 was there, the, the, uh, the, it was positive to the peptidoglycan. So th then they had proper negative controls and so forth. And in figure two, what they, they um, decided to make a um, TLR3 knockout mouse. And so the data in this figure are, um, showing that they could make one and, and, it, and it was the phenotype um, corresponded to the genotype. And then uh, in figure three, in the A portion, they're looking at uh, poly IC stimulation of the wild type in the solid um, symbols and the TLR3 knockout in the open, uh, open symbols. And you can see that you, they found what they were looking for. <laughs> of course, that's what scientists do. <laughs> and here we have poly, we have multiple uh, stimuli of the diff different TLR, 
TLR molecules, poly-IC um, uh, was negative in the TLR3 knockout, uh, whereas it was positive in the wild type. LPS was positive in both, as was peptidoglycan, zymosin, and so forth. And so that's all I really want to show. And we will stop the screen sharing at that point and go on to the discussion. So they conclude <laughs> you know, with all these data and plus other data that I didn't show you is, is that TLR3 is critical in the recognition of double-stranded RNA. They, at this point in time, in 2001, uh, almost 20 years ago, they said that they, the importance of TLR3 in antiviral responses remains to be established. And they figured that what they really needed to do was to um, take these knockout mice and infect them with all kinds of virus, different kinds of viruses and see what happened by comparison to the wild type. And that was yet to, yet to come. Now, one of the reasons that I wanted to focus on this, in addition to my own personal history in this whole process, was that now we're steeped in the COVID, COVID pandemic. And from the very beginning, I felt that the, the, the first thing that, that struck me about this infection was, was that there was a long incubation period, a week to 10 days to 14 days after infection, uh, when the people were asymptomatic. They didn't have any symptoms. And then suddenly they would have an onset of, of severe inflammatory symptoms, particularly the most um, uh, disturbing were the ones in the lung where their uh, tiny little air sacs filled up with inflammatory fluid and brought the patient to the hospital and to the ICU and onto a ventilator. So, the major thing to take home from that is what I also stressed last week with LPS, uh, and that is that the symptoms are not due to the microbe or to the microbial products. They're due to the, they are due to the micro, microbe and microbial products that stimulate the host response that, that um, causes the inflammatory cytokines to be released. TNF, uh, IL-6, interleukin-1, uh, interferon gamma, there's a whole host of them that <laughs> are spring into action. Now, with regard to viral infections, particularly, the interferon response, it's coming from the innate immune system. And that means that it's primarily coming from well, it's, it's, it's coming from the infected cells, whatever they happen to be, whether they're uh, epithelial cells or endothelial cells or, or whatever, because in, in, when the virus gets inside the cells and starts to replicate, one of the things that happens is a double-stranded um, uh, moiety in the replication process for, be, for each of these viruses uh, activates the cells to say, okay, we've got a problem here. And they start making interferon. Consequently, for viruses to still be around here in our, um, in our world, and they've had to deal with the innate immune response over bajillions of years. And the way they've done that is uh, in many respects, and, uh, and I've mentioned before, smallpox virus is one of them, uh, and measles is another one, where after, the same thing happens. Uh, after infection, there is a prodrome period, and an incubation period, as the physicians called it, call it, so that there's the, the patients are asymptomatic. Um, but then the inflammatory response happens, and in smallpox and measles, the inflammatory response is manifested by the rash. In COVID, it's manifested by um, shortness of breath and, um, and a dropping oxygen sa saturation. Anyway, the whole pathophysiology and immunopathology is exactly the same. Um, and, and so that there's multiple ways that the uh, viruses have figured out ways to, to, to impair the inflammatory or the interferon response uh, in, in a virus infected cell. And one of them, and, and that's, uh, there's a very nice review article that just came out, I think in June or July in immunological reviews by 
Alina Zuniga from UCSD in California. On the, and the title of this review, so it's an immunological review, so if you want to look it up, and the author's name is Zuniga, Z-U-N-I-G-A, and it's interferon induction, evasion, and paradoxical roles during, during SARS-CoV-2 infection. And once she, she goes into the, to the details of the whole interferon response that has evolved since this paper that we just that, that I just talked about in the last 20 years and, and, and how the virus interacts with and tries to impair or, or does impair the whole uh, response. They, they can evade the immune sensing of, um, say, the double-stranded RNA. They, they have gene, gene products in the, in the virus that in, inhibit the interferon synthesis and secretion. And they have other genes and gene products that suppress um, the interferon receptor signaling mechanism, once, even if it is produced. So there's a whole bunch of different ways that these um, that these viruses try to muck up our immune, our wonderful immune response that has evolved over the millennia. And um, with that, um, so I recommend you read uh, Zuniga's paper, and I recommend you read this this paper. There's another paper also on the website that I meant to mention. That's by um, Akira that came out in 2000, before this paper in 2001, that, that deals with bacterial DNA and how uh, the, another TLR molecule uh, recognizes bacterial DNA, um, uh, TLR9. And, and um, so that's also a very important paper, as are all the rest of them, but I, it'll be redundant if we went into all of them. So I'll stop there. Don't forget to like the video and click on the bell and check out and subscribe to the, um, to the channel and check out the website. Thanks, it's been fun. If you're new to immunology uh, or you just wanna delve into a certain aspect of this uh, large field and you wanna get a grasp on things, you should buy my new book, Molecular Immunity because it's a chronology of all of the important experiments and discoveries that have been made uh, in the last 60 years. It's concise, but it's also very comprehensive. And it's the only such book that's been written uh, since 1970. So you can buy it on Amazon and together with the YouTube videos of the Classics and Immunology Journal Club, you can't go wrong.